Good evening, and uh, welcome to our um, keynote address for our Amish and their neighbors uh, conference. We've had a good afternoon of learning and connecting and networking and more learning and conversation that continued um, over dinner. Lovely meal, I believe. In a moment, uh, Elizabethtown College President Elizabeth Ryder will offer um, some words of welcome on behalf of the college and introduce our speaker for this evening. President Ryder has a long career at Elizabethtown College, uh, spending the first half as a faculty member in the Department of Psychology and uh, more recent years in various administrative positions, including provost and now um, president. Her teaching uh, has included courses in developmental psychology and exceptional children and the psychology of women and other, um, other uh, topics. She's the author of several books, including Lifespan Human Development, a widely used textbook across the country, now in its 10th edition. President Ryder is a graduate of Gettysburg College and Vanderbilt University, and I welcome her uh, to the stage to welcome you. Thank you, Dr. Nolt, for that uh, introduction. I am uh, pleased to be here with you this evening. I hope you've had a great day, despite the uh, little bit of stormy weather that we had. But the good news is I believe it has uh, cut down the humidity, and tomorrow is supposed to be delightful. So welcome. This is uh, the fifth Young Center Amish Studies Conference since 2007. This year's conference has um, 146 registered attendees from many different academic institutions, healthcare institutions, various government offices and agencies, as well as from the private sector. It's exciting to know that attendees are registered from 15 states, as well as from Ireland, Israel, Switzerland, and United Kingdom. Some of you may have been here for previous uh, conferences, while others may be attending for the first time and visiting our campus for the first time. Uh, regardless, I welcome all of you, and I'm so thrilled that you can be here this evening. It's my pleasure as president of Elizabethtown College to greet you this evening, and most especially to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Carl Deport Bowman. For more than 20 years, Dr. Bowman has directed social survey research at the University of Virginia's Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. Among them, the Institute surveys on the state of disunion, the politics of character, and difference in democracy. He also directed two benchmark national surveys of cultural trends within the Church of the Brethren. Recognized as a leading cultural historian of the Brethren, his scholarship has resulted in the books Brethren Society, the Cultural Transformation of a Peculiar People, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, and Portrait of a People, The Church of the Brethren at 300, from the Brethren Press, as well as numerous articles and reviews. Additionally, he is co-author with Donald uh, Crable on the, road to, the Back Road to Heaven, Older Order, Old Order, Hutterites, Mennonites, Amish, and Brethren, from the Johns Hopkins Press. Broadly speaking, his research has explored the cultural dynamics of religious minorities as they navigate the tensions and challenges posed by the broader culture. Dr. Deport Bowman is a 1979 alumnus of Elizabethtown College, where he majored in sociology. He then earned a master's degree in sociology at the University of Wisconsin and a doctoral degree at the University of Virginia, also in sociology. Before joining UVA's Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, he was a professor of sociology at Bridgewater College in Virginia and worked as a senior statistical consultant with Cranes International in Bang Bangalore, India. This evening, in his lecture, Tacit Tribes and Soft Allegiances in American Life, Dr. Deport Bowman will present broader context for our thinking about how distinctive communities interact with one another today. The past two decades have witnessed extreme political polarization and paralysis, culture world wars, and racial diversity and division. These have been obvious and the focus of both media and scholarly commentary. What is less obvious 
are the tacit cultural tribes into which Americans sort themselves and their allegiances that often remain unrecognized and unspoken. Dr. Day Port Bowman will explore the American cultural context of early 21st century, especially as it pertains to the Amish and other Plain communities as they interact with their neighbors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Day Port Bowman. Good evening. Um, wow, it's quite an introduction. <laughs> I'm humbled. Um, I've uh, spent a lot of time here over the years at Elizabethtown, although it's been a while now, um, in addition to being a student here back when I was a different person at a different time. Um, I, I served on the faculty here for a couple of years, and. Uh, and that was a, a good experience too. Some of my last colleagues have just retired. I think of uh, Fletcher McClellan and, and some people like that. Don Crabill um, was a mentor and uh, taught me a few things. Um, among them were how to write when I have time to sit down and edit my stuff. Um, Don, uh, I took a second course with him in the sociology department. And he, uh, he, he looked at my writing, which I knew was fabulous because I'd always gotten A's on my writing. And, uh, and he gave me a C on something and he marked it up, the, the entire thing. He just shredded it. And a C to me was a bad grade. Uh, so, so anyway, um, I learned a lesson which was don't ever use five words to say something you can say with uh, three words or four words. Now, I'm not sure Don follows that in all of his own writing, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I did learn a lot here at Elizabethtown, and I always enjoy coming back. Um, my primary focus this evening is really going to be on, on the broader American context. And I, I haven't deciphered the tribal piece as much as I would have liked, um, but I think it's something we can talk about and raise some questions about at the end of the talk. Uh, it's, it's one thing for the Amish to, to oppose a modern world that uh, has more of a normative consensus and where, where there's something much firmer and more solid to stand in opposition to. It's, it's another thing to try and carve out a distinct, separate reality in a time where the modern world itself is divided into completely different things, uh, each of which present their own challenges, and some of which are probably more attractive to the Amish than others. So I will, um, I'm, I'm going to read for a while and, uh, and I'll try to do it in a way where it doesn't seem like I'm reading so much. My primary focus this evening will be upon those of us whom the Amish call English. What cultural values and faith understandings do the Amish encounter among their neighbors as they move off the farm and into the capitalist marketplace? And, and by the way, I, I worked quite a bit on some Amish literature back when we were writing Back Roads to Heaven, but there has been so much done on the Amish in the last 15 years or so that I, that I spent considerable time just trying to brush up my Amish chops and, and have, have a little better sense for what's going on with them. But the, one of the things that amazes me is the extent of movement into non-agricultural occupations. And I think it raises really interesting questions about uh, what the Amish will look like in another 20 years. So as, as they moved off their farm into the capitalist marketplace, into things that, 
they never could have imagined into realities that not so long ago were very foreign to them, uh, but now are quite familiar, doing business with the English, interacting with the English, and, uh, and not having their economy based upon a complete family enterprise where all are working together towards the same goal. These are very significant changes. So who are their neighbors? And what is the broader cultural situation in which the Amish find themselves during the er early decades of this new millennium? Even though scholars today no longer describe the Amish as a traditional folk society like they once did, clinging to its heritage, avoiding the modern world, most analyses of the Amish do set up an explicit or implicit distinction between the resisting, negotiating, and accommodating Amish and something called modernity. Terms such as modernity, postmodern, liquid modernity, crop up in most, if not all, of contemporary Amish scholarship. Modernity is sometimes depicted as the context and sometimes as a metaphorical actor, the great separator. It is frequently visualized in terms of the production and consumption technologies of our age. When I was young, modernity was an assembly line in a factory. It was automatic transmission. I remember when those came out. Electric turkey carving knives at Thanksgiving, baby formula, stereophonic records, and color television. Uh, some of us, well, there are probably some here who, who didn't grow up with television, but uh, some of us grew up in an era when it was all black and white. My first stereo was a quadraphonic eight-track system. When I bought it, it symbolized progress, the wave of the future. Little did I suspect that both quadraphonic and eight-track technology would die within a decade. But then that's the way we commonly understand modernity. Modernity means change, constant change. And how did moderns view the Amish? When I was young, the Amish had already outlived their prior popular image, popular imaginary. From the turn of the 20th century through about the 1950s, they were seen from the outside as anti-modern relics, living the way everyone had once lived and on their way to extinction. By the 1950s, however, it had become obvious that the Amish weren't going anywhere. Well, they were going places, but they weren't going away. They, were no, they weren't on the path to extinction. Even so, most Amish lived out their lives as rural farmers and were largely ignored by moderns who lived beyond their immediate area. To be sure, TV shows like the Beverly Hillbillies, Mr. Ed, Green Acres marketed images of country bumpkins and of bumpkins encountering city life for the first time, but they largely ignored the Amish. Americans who lived near the Amish, of course, knew more about them but even many of them understood the Amish story to be simple. They lived the way everyone used to long after others had moved on. I remember that John Hostetler and John Ruth's 1975 film, which I saw in an introduction to sociology class, entitled The, the, uh, the Amish, disseminated this theme of doing everything the way everyone had at one point in time. It disseminated the theme in the substance of the film and in the subtitle, A People of Preservation. So the Amish in the popular imagination have been relics on their way to extinction, irrelevant throwbacks, and more recently, active negotiators, and even more recently, celebrities. We all now understand that change even strategic change is commonplace among the Amish. Yet the Amish themselves may not have changed as much as the stories we tell about them have changed. That noted, let me return to my major focus, to those of us the Amish call English. In scholarship about the Amish, the details of modernity is largely glossed over. It is painted with sweeping references to technology, progress, change, 
discontinuity, mobility, transience, specialization, bureaucracy as opposed to informality, and individualism. All of these things are what we're supposed to be. Modernity is fast, noisy, aggressive, violent, nationalistic, and pluralistic. You don't have to watch the news too long or too many days at this point in time to have those kinds of images come up. These are the forces and qualities the Amish must contend with, so we are told. But is this really a, a fair depiction of moderns? Is that really the way we are? Survey data has its limitations, but it can teach us a few things about the neighbors of the Amish. My primary source for what follows is a National Survey of Moral Formation conducted by the University of Virginia Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture and fielded by the Gallup organization. The survey was delivered by internet or snail mail to a scientific sample of American parents of teenage children and a separate survey to one of their teenage children. Each questionnaire contained over 300 questions. Just over 3,000 parent-teen dyads completed the survey, yielding a data file with approximately 2 million data points. Data were collected from November 2017 through early 2019. We are still analyzing the data and sifting through the findings. Um, it's, it's been quite a task, and, and the, con the question of polarization is something that's been central, even though it's a survey of moral formation. So let's consider America's parents. What values do moderns, or the English, hope to instill in their children? We explored this question by presenting parents with a list of aspirations for their children's future. What kind of adult? do they want their children to become? Qualities ranged from wealthy, famous, physically attractive, powerful and influential, physically fit, patriotic and creative, to classical virtues such as loving, hardworking, humble, honest, forgiving, reliable and dependable. Every parent rated the importance of each of these items. Is that legible? Yeah, I think you can see it. So this chart displays the percentage of American parents who said that each quality was either very important or absolutely essential for the kind of person they wanted their child to become. Note that popular stereotypes of moderns as being highly concerned with image, physical beauty, wealth, attaining power and influence, and seeking their moment of fame receive little support in our research. Instead, this subset of qualities suggests that American parents are much more concerned with their children's ambition to get ahead, their level of edu education, and whether they rise to some level of le leadership. We could summarize this chart by saying that contrary to rumor, American parents prioritize the practical and utilitarian over the shallow and superficial. But interestingly, moderns, the authors of Hochmut, rate humility as more important for their children's future than any of these qualities. Humility is more important than ambition, than education, patriotism, physical fitness. Humility is more important than power and wealth. Two-thirds of modern American parents consider it an absolutely essential or very important quality for their children's future. I'm not saying that they actually raised their children to be humble. <laughs> I'm saying that when you give them a choice, something leads them to, to rate humility pretty highly, that that's, that's a value that they'd like to see in their children. Yet as highly as it is regarded, humility is in the middle of the pack in terms of importance. Even more dear to moderns, are the personal qualities of honesty, reliability, and dependability, a work ethic, treating others in a loving fashion, and developing strong moral character. 
All of these come close to receiving a near universal endorsement by modern parents. Beyond that, preserving close ties with family is considered very important by nearly nine out of 10 parents. They sound almost Amish, don't they? Of course, the aspirations that parents express for their children could be quite different than their children's own aspirations, but we have the data on the children, and they were not. Parents rated, or the children rated these things much more highly than some of the other things I pointed out as well. So their, the teenage children's hopes largely mirror those of their parents, and I think maybe contrary to my generation, um, it's, it's amazing how much young people today imbibe the values and the faith uh, uh, of their parents. You can pretty well predict a lot of uh, the worldview and the values of, of teenagers by, by surveying their parents. Okay, so there are many, many ways to consider the moral commitments endemic to modern American life. An additional approach that we took was to identify adages that would measure the sentiments of American parents and teens with respect to classical virtues. We went back to some uh, literature on the Aristotelian virtues and tried to come up with common sayings that could represent some of those. In, in each case, we uh, identified moral op oppositions, some of which I have included in this chart. So many of these statements have to do with altruism, sacrifice, concern for the other. Others have to do with honesty, and still others touch upon, upon hard work or a sense of purpose in life. The gray bars in the middle, as you, as you look at this, um, the gray bars in the middle are the people who said, I don't have a leaning one way or the other on, on, on the opposition that we set up. And then the light blue and the purple to the left are people who moved either somewhat or all the way towards em embracing the slogans on the left. And on this side, the, the pink and then the red going in this direction are people who embraced uh, slightly or completely these statements on the right. Um, again, you know, we have a social desirability kind of thing that goes on with research like this, but, but that noted, um, when, when you look at teenagers, um, they're embracing the, the, the classical virtues much more than things that represent selfishness or looking out for myself. Um, what lying, what people don't know won't hurt them. Um, so so the, the tilt was completely toward that direction. Another thing, though, that, that's interesting to me, and it's something we've tried to think about going through the survey data, is that big gray bar in the middle. Um, it's, uh, in, in, in Spain, they would call people who won't get off the fence and, and come down on one side or the other, pasotas. They, they just are leaving it aside. Uh, in, in this country, I, I tend to think of them as uh, whatever teenagers. Um, and I say that with a, a negative tone in my voice. Uh, but my, my own children learned um, that no matter how old they were or how much they knew, if, if dad was trying to interact with them and instruct them in so something, th they should never roll their eyes and say whatever. You know, it's, it's, it was my pet peeve as a parent, and, and most of them uh, worked with me on that. So, uh, you can see from the bottom item that the idea of sacrificing for others wins out over self-interest, but the big winner is neutrality. As if teens were saying, if you're making me choose between myself and someone else, I'll sit on the fence. Based upon what we've seen thus far, and setting aside our technological differences with the Amish, I could almost be persuaded that modern American culture isn't very different from Amish culture. Clearly, Americans at large are more, more concerned about helping and forgiving others, kindness and deference, right and wrong, even humility, than is often portrayed. 
These are moral touchstones or cultural bridges, so to speak, with the Amish. Um, we do, in spite of the fact that I don't speak Pennsylvania Dutch and, uh, and, and we look quite different and we have different community, uh, communities and extent of community govern governance and things like that, um, we do speak a lot of common language when you come down to some of these basic values. Okay, so let's turn to the religious faith of modern Americans. Half of American parents tell us their religious beliefs are either very important or the most important thing in their lives. Two-thirds say faith in God is at least fairly important, but that leaves a third who say either that their religious beliefs are unimportant or that they have no religious beliefs at all, a third. 20% of parents, many of whom self-identify as an agnostic or atheist, say they are religiously unattached. And slightly more, about 25%, say they are evangelical or born-again Christians. Some of you who follow some of these uh, religious statistics coming out from PRRI, the Pew Center, et cetera, it, it, the, the most striking development really in the last decade is that the number of people, uh, the nuns they're called in some places, but the number of people completely unattached to religion or who are, are no longer ashamed to say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an agnostic, I, I'm an atheist, that it's, it's been on the increase very dramatically in the last couple of decades. Four out of every 10 American parents say they attend religious services at least two or three times a month. But even more, 55%, just over half, say either that they rarely attend services or they never do it at all. It's interesting that most American parents say, more American parents say they never attend religious services than say they attend weekly. More never go to church than go weekly. The number of attenders is higher, of course, in the rural areas where the Amish tend to reside personal spirituality, as reflected in private prayer, is more common than attendance at religious services. Although we were looking for this group of people who say uh, they think they're spiritual, uh, but not religious. It's, it's been said about teens a lot, and we find very few teens describing themselves in that way. They either say, you know, I'm, I'm not religious, I have no religious beliefs, or, or they tend to be more in, much more involved in youth groups, church groups, et cetera. That's the big division, actually. When you, when you think about tribes in this country and, and you think about even political polarization, the, 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 the difference between the very faithful and people who have a completely secular orientation is, is the tribal difference that's most pronounced. So uh, about, a, about a third of, of parents read scripture at least once a week, but more say they never do. And even though only a third read scripture on any regular basis, over half of parents say the Bible is the word of God. You can make what you will of that incongruity. But when confronted with a difficult moral situation in the course of daily living, only three of every 10 parents say the guidance of God or scripture is the most important thing in deciding what to do, how to move forward in a difficult situation. Compared to half who say it, it's most important to do whatever is best for everyone involved. We can reasonably conclude from this mixed bag of belief and unbelief and belief unaccompanied by practice that the faith of modern Americans is a mile wide, but not very deep. Many contemporary analysts refer to it as a thin faith or a therapeutic faith, or oriented primarily toward positive feelings it evokes among believers. Chris Smith, who, who I expect some of you have heard of, refers to the faith of American moderns as moralistic therapeutic deism, which distills down to one, 
God creates and orders the world and then watches from the sidelines. Two, God wants people to be nice to each other. Three, the central goal of life is to feel happy and to feel good about oneself. Four, God is to be turned to only when you really get into a jam. And five, going to heaven is something that will happen to you if you're good. So that's kind of, he, he distills that to the essence of the faith that, that young people in, in the country uh, share today. Unlike some of the aspirations and ethics that we considered earlier from which we could almost conclude that Amish culture is similar to that of their neighbors, their religious beliefs and the role of religion in their daily lives is a world apart from the religion of their neighbors. There, there's no real comparison there. Some additional moral ideas that American parents hold dear. So this is the percent of parents who agree. Everyone has a right to be treated with respect. Almost everybody agrees with that. I am sure that my life has a larger purpose. 75% agree, much larger than the uh, percent of people who are religious. Deep down, people are basically good. 71% agree. Divorce is better than staying in an unhappy marriage. There's overwhelming agreement with that statement. It's 70%, and the number is even higher among American teenagers. What people think of as absolutely true is really just their personal opinion. 62% agree. You should follow your own passions wherever they lead you. 62%. There is life after death. 61% agree with that. About four out of 10 do not. God knows everything that will ever happen to me. 58% agree. The greatest moral virtue is to be honest about your feelings and desires. The greatest moral virtue is to be honest about your feelings and desires. 58% agree. As long as we don't hurt others, we should all just live however we want. 50% agree with that. So a final component of the cultural context within which the Amish increasingly move and operate has to do with family priorities, specifically the priority of faith in raising a child. In a couple of our recent national surveys, we asked parents to rank the importance of therapeutic, communitarian, religious, practical, and traditional priorities goals for their parenting. The the statements representing these priorities are, the therapeutic goal was, I seek to raise children who are happy and feel good about themselves and their relationships. The communitarian goal, I seek to raise children who will make positive contributions to their community and to the world around them. The religious goal, I seek to raise children whose lives will reflect God's will and purpose. The achievement goal, I seek to provide every financial advantage and educational opportunity to my children so that they have the best chance of being successful and achieving their goals in life. And the family heritage goal, I seek to raise children who are true to the values and traditions of their family heritage. This was a ranking. They were asked in in terms of how you prioritize goals for raising your children, How, how do you rank these? This is what we came up with. Um, the, the dark green is the percent who said that goal is the most important goal. Light green, second most important. The, the sort of gray one is in the middle. Fourth in, in importance is the pink and the, and the sort of salmon color is, is the least important of all. Um, it's pretty overwhelming that if you ask a, a random sample of American parents in this country, what is most important of all in raising children. It's raising children who are happy and feel good about themselves and their relationships. The the second ranked one was children who make positive contributions to their community and the world. And you can go on down, it's very clear that, I mean, 
I, I doubt that the family heritage one would surprise too many of you. And uh, although the giving them opportunities and advantages to succeed in life, it's, it's, it's pretty low down there too. The, the thing that again testifies to the tribalism that I've been alluding to along the way is this, is this middle one. Notice the size of the gray on, on all of the others and, and compared to the green on one side and the salmon on the far right side. The, the statement that says, um, I want to raise children who live lives that reflect God's will and purpose was actually picked as a first most important goal by a, a large sample of Americans. That's about a, a third. Um, but an even larger number picked it as the very bottom priority in, in raising children. Um, and it, the, the, the pattern is different than, than every other goal. Um, an, another thing that was interesting looking at, at this particular set is people who said they want to raise children who are happy and feel good about themselves and their relationships, that's their top goal. What was the most common next, or, or the, the faithful one, let's live lives that reflect God's will and purpose, often fell to the bottom for anyone who picked the happiness goal as, as their top priority. However, for people who picked faith as their top priority, the happiness relationship goal still came in second place uh, just, just underneath of faith. So it's not that people of faith um, aren't concerned about happiness and aren't concerned about people having good relationships. It's just they don't make it their top priority. Um, the people who do make the, the ha happiness their top priority tend to drop faith completely out of the picture. It, it was not something we expected to see. So this has um, broader implications for the Amish than is immediately apparent, for it underscores the cultural rift between moderns with religious and secular priorities. Amish have historically viewed the world as a more or less monolithic threat to their faith and their way of life. But the world, as, as a lot of playing groups see it, as the Amish sometimes refer to it, is itself highly divided today along partisan lines what some now refer to as tribes because they are so uh, coalesced and they have their own symbolism and, and uh, you know, the Amish speak Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, the partisan divide in, um, in American society is one where we may all speak English, but we speak different languages. We speak different varieties of English and, and it's hard to communicate across that partisan divide. So speaking for us moderns, the neighbors of the Amish, our sources of information, understandings of reality, and the threats we perceive to our own modern ways of life now diverge dramatically. And this rift between religious and secular moderns is just growing. Not only that, but our cosmologies increasingly align with our political identities and partisan affiliations. When I was young, there was a much more diverse mix of the religious and secular, conservatives and liberals within each political party. There were liberal Republicans. There were Republicans who put liberals on the Supreme Court. There, you know, um, uh, environmental reg uh, re restrictions were done under a Republican president. Things were much more mixed within political parties. I think the same is true for, for our churches. Um, it, 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 you could go into uh, congregations and there was a greater mix of progressives and conservatives and people with different theologies, at least in a lot of mainstream churches. Now, um, progressives have moved out of the church a lot into that secular camp of people who've kind of written off faith and religion. And, uh, and uh, many, many congregations that, like one that I attend, that would have looked more liberal um, 
you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, looks increasingly conservative and evangelical. So uh, a guy, a Bishop, wrote a book called The Big Sort. Don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it, it, it's, it addresses how in residential communities, uh, in churches, in political parties, how people in America are increasingly sorting themselves into these different camps and, uh, and our information sources are completely different. I didn't put this slide up, but we did an interesting analysis of, of the positions that people take, uh, cultural positions that they take based upon their information sources and did a little totem pole as to how many thought certain things. And here were the NPR viewers, and here were the CBS, NBC viewers, and everything down toward the bottom. And on some of those that were conservative statements or statements about um, political correctness or fake news or what have you, Fox News viewers were way up at the top of this totem pole or, or thermometer in a completely different camp. And I'm, I'm trying to say that very descriptively, I'm not dismissing Fox News at all, I'm just saying that, that our, our culture, as people out there in the world, the English, is, is uh, extremely fragmented at this point in time, and, and things like our, our media have really contributed to that. So, um, you can predict, you can predict from their cultural positions pretty accurately now who someone would vote for in an election. I, I can ask you these questions. Are you strongly pro-life? Do you feel that the American way of life is threatened by immigrants crossing our southern border? Does the word socialism make you cringe? Are you strongly opposed to gay marriage? Are you a Christian whose faith is the central guiding feature of your daily life? If your answer to those questions is yes, then you're in all likelihood a Republican and you voted for Donald Trump. It's, it's, it's pretty clear cut. You can, you can predict those things. And these are packages of, of issues, which is another reason people are thinking of them as tribes. Do you think of yourself as pro-choice? Are you deeply committed to justice for minorities? Are you deeply concerned about the threat posed by climate change and the presence of assault rifles in, in, our, in our streets? Are you uninvolved or only peripherally involved in a community of faith? Then you are in all likelihood a Democrat. The people who call themselves identicals are, sort themselves almost completely into a conservative political tribe now, and African Americans sort themselves almost completely, regardless of religious faith, how, how, uh, how religious or secular they are, into a progressive camp. And uh, so, for many moderns, personal faith has become tightly interwoven with political identity on, on a whole range of cultural issues. All I have to do is look at how, how often someone prays to predict their party identification. Setting independence aside for the moment, modern parents who pray more than once a day are 10.5 times more likely to identify as Republican than parents who say they never pray. And parents who say their religious beliefs are the most important thing in their life are 14.5 times, times more likely to identify as Republicans than those who say their religious beliefs are unimportant or non-existent. Americans who self-identify as evangelical Christians are even more partisan. They were three times more likely to vote for Trump than other Christians. So let's conclude with a few, a few additional observations about the Amish. Americans find the Amish fasc fascinating in part because they integrate nicely with the modern American narrative of respect for diversity. Diversity and tolerance are, are huge themes in our culture presently. And, and that lifts up a group like the Amish that once would have been looked down upon uh, much more commonly. 
Unlike other minorities, the Amish are doubly fascinating because they appear to reject the very technologies and commodities that we hold most dear, things we believe, many of us believe you couldn't live without. In the popular American imagination, the Amish are today's Beverly Hillbillies, unsophisticated rural dwellers employing folk wisdom handed down through the generations and comically ignorant of most of what happens in the world. I, I will never forget the time um, I was interacting with an old order Mennonite in the Dayton, Virginia area. And we were sitting at a picnic table just having a nice chat about whatever. <laughs> and, and, uh, the, and he knew we had done some traveling. And he looks at me and he says, what language do they speak in France? And, and I kept a straight face and I answered his question straightforwardly because he was genuinely interested. But that's the kind of thing that goes into the media all the time now and, and, and it becomes comedy fodder uh, in, in our media. Although the Amish garner a certain respect in the American moral imaginary, their way of life isn't taken very seriously. The Amish are popular celebrities to be marveled at in brief visits to Amish country, returning home with Amish-laden crafts and souvenirs. Like Bosch in home appliances and Tesla in cars, Amish is the make of furniture to buy if you're interested in quality. Moderns are most titillated by stories of Amish breaking free from community constraints, tasting freedom for the first time, or experiencing forbidden fruit or forbidden romance. Romspringa narratives, which really took off you know, some years ago, I think there were a lot of interviews from the Young Center about this phenomenon at that point in time, but those are such stories. And, uh, and stories about the Amish doing drugs or going to bed with someone as a courtship practice uh, generate uh, the same kind of reaction. Uh, this, this was, uh, I was looking for some recent media things out on the internet. This is media, Kelly, and Ma Megan Kelly, and, and if you look, it's a runaway Amish girl, like, and, and the girl's story was she, she physically ran away and, and, and how traumatic it was. Maybe, maybe some of you know who that is. But, uh, but the, things kept coming up on TV like no joy and, and uh, you know, and then and there's silence in the bed. They sleep together on their first date, but there's silence in the bed, you know, and, and, and this is part of the media presentation that's put out there. Vis visiting Amish country is an intriguing alternative to the beach or an amusement park. The more Amish dress the dress, the longer their beards, the more old fashioned their technology, the more quaint the buggy ride, the better the Amish experience. Most moderns don't visit the Amish out of deep respect or genuine interest in deeply understanding their faith and way of life they are attracted by the Amish spectacle and they buy an Amish t-shirt the same way we'd buy one from Dis Disneyland or a rock concert. And, and I was amazed at the plethora of Amish t-shirts that are out there for sale on, on the internet. I mean, look at this, pimp my buggy Amish style. And I'm not sure I can see exactly what the image is supposed to be there. Keeping it rural, I'm as bored as an Amish electrician. Uh, don't drink or drive, you know. Amish gone wild with a little light switch there, like she's breaking the rules because she turned the switch on and off. And Amish lives matter. I haven't seen any of these actually out in public, but uh, they're all over the internet. You know, a couple more. This, this, this one at least is fairly basic. Amish country, Pennsylvania. I would think that would be a, a more common one. But the Rumspringer, you can see what Rumspringer is like among the Amish. I mean. Every book I've read by an Amish scholar depicts it just like that. And Amish girls have no way of knowing if it's a romantic candlelight dinner or just a regular dinner. You know, it's, it's like it, this is the, the, the stuff that's out there. Um, I've, I've, I'd like to have 
another three months to write a conclusion to this presentation. <laughs> Be, because I think that, uh, y you know, th there are some real dangers for the Amish. Um, a lot of the scholarship on, on the Amish, it's like, well, they, they are very strategic and they can see their way forward and they, they do this and they reject this and there's a logic to it because, because it preserves their boundaries and, and they can keep being Amish. I don't think in the present you can see what the unintended consequences are of, of decisions you make sometimes and things like a cell phone and, or other technologies that have to do with the Amish going into business. Um, those those are treading on boundaries and the blurring of boundaries that you know could have a really strong impact upon the Amish long term. The um, the uh, fact that Americans love the Amish is likely to flatter the Amish, and and that they want the Amish to be very Amish is likely to crystallize Amish identities in ways that they might not have been if they didn't have to have that, that beard that looks a certain way or that dress or that buggy. So um, the question of, of uh, how some of these things and the division, the tribal division in, in modern America that I've made reference to, how that will impact the Amish, because we can see which side of that tribal division the Amish are attracted to. And, and I think in the last 10 years, uh, staying out of elections has been a, uh, which is what they've done traditionally, has been a difficult thing for the Amish because they are permitted to vote. It's frowned upon, but they, they, they don't get uh, you know, disciplined by the community, at least in, I think, most Amish groups. And uh, uh, so, so there are images up all over the place about Amish attending Trump rallies and Amish turning out for Trump and, and, and things like that. And it's just, those are gonna be difficulties to sort through. It's not just Trump and it's not just now, but they're having to encounter the world in, uh, in ways that they didn't 20, 30 years ago. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Carl. We have time for uh, questions. We have two microphones in the lower corners. I uh, ask you to make your way to the uh, microphones uh, and state your question. Um, and invite you to, uh, to do so. I can begin with a question, but I don't want my question to stop you all from going to the, uh, to the microphones to, uh, to, to ask. Um, so, uh, Carl, do you, um, the, 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 the larger kind of macro-American survey data uh, that you have, which is, which is fascinating, do you have a, um, a sense of, or a guess, or um, of how that context shapes or would shape perceptions of uh, the Amish in places in which the Amish live versus you know, Southern California, Arizona, something like that. For example, uh, living here in Lancaster County, um, I know a fair number of uh, English folks who have a rather dim view of the Amish. Uh, I'm not saying it's a fair or accurate view, but it kind of comes from living around here and things maybe that their parents or grandparents said or maybe actual direct encounters, but whatever. they, uh, As opposed to, and they would say that uh, people who, you know, live somewhere else uh, have a, an overly romantic view of the Amish, and yet the person I'm thinking of and the person who has that so-called romantic view of the Amish might actually be in the same tribe as you, as you uh, described. So just, just curious about uh, how, how, does, how does local context or does it, uh, I, I don't think the survey data probably doesn't tell you that, I'm just, I'm just curious what you think about that. It's, it's a little difficult, Steve, for me to think about that in relation to the Amish and, and 
One reason is that I, I do not have the amount of data in, in local Amish communities to, to do that. That would be a fascinating thing to do, and you could, you could collect that data. Um, these surveys cost huge amounts of money, but I'd love to see the Young Center <laughs> fund something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I could think about it ethnographically, ethnographically a little bit, but my primary experience with playing groups is with the old German Baptist brethren and, uh, and direct experience. That's where I did some ethnographic work. And with uh, Mennonites down, down in uh, Shenandoah Valley, and they're, they're quite different from the Amish. Um, they're, they're, they're not set apart as much as the Amish are. They, they don't have a, a different language. You know, they're, they're not, I mean, some of the groups that call themselves old, old order down there are riding in buggies, but some are not. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can certainly see how what you, what you said could be true, that within, say, if, if it's people on the progressive side of things, that some might still, in spite of the fact maybe that they aren't religious at all, really respect that earnestness of faith and, and feel really good about the Amish, and others might just think it's, uh, you know, again, something to dismiss. I tried to talk a little bit historically about different views of the Amish at different points in time, but I'm, I'm not very prepared to talk about the reaction in the local community. But there might be others in the room who would have, who would have thoughts on that. Hello, I'm, I'm curious, one of your data points was um, patriotism or patriotic was on that line. I wonder how you think of that in terms of these tribes and how the um, views of the Amish would fit in there and how someone who maybe um, identifies more as um, anti-war or conscientious objector, I could see how that might fall more on that progressive side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't hear the first part of your question. There's um, just that patri patriotism was on one of your data points and where people who identify maybe, I'm, I'm not sure where someone who would fall more on that conservative end and maybe, maybe more religious end might also be more inclined, um, particularly in your data with children, saying that they would want them to be patriotic too and how that would, because that seems, that seems kind of not Amish to me, the patriotism. In that, at least in the way that a lot of Americans would think of it. Some items, like if you're referring to patriotism, if, if, you're, if you're referring to patriotism in particular, it's, that's not a divisive value. Um, um, you have to get pretty far off to the left wing uh, in, in this country before you have people who don't particularly think of themselves as patriotic or global citizens, but I'd say most progressives and most conservatives uh, can endorse patriotism. As a matter of fact, um, you know, we, we looked at a lot of things like that, labels um, and, and how they break out, and you have things like the environment and a couple of things that I mentioned, you know, gun control, et cetera, that really divide people, but, but it, it's nice that on on some things like patriotism that you can see some basis for coming together. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but okay. I don't think, um, I don't think that uh, on issues of, of peace and pacifism that that breaks out real neatly ac across these tribal lines either. And yet a term like socialism, um, the, when you look at survey data and you, and you see what politicians are doing, it makes good sense why 
uh, Republicans are always throwing up the term socialist to describe their, their Democratic colleagues. Um, Republicans do hate the word socialist, and it's overwhelming. And if you look at Democrats, they, they actually feel, in survey data, they actually feel as positive, if not more positive, about the term socialist than capitalist. You know, so, so some things like that really do break out uh, according to these different tribes. Tony Walsh, Maynooth University outside Dublin, Ireland. Carl, thank you for a very revealing exposition of American society. I suppose I'm interested, first of all, in the contrast with uh, European and particularly society in the British Isles, where there is a huge flood towards secularization. In England, only about 2% of the population would have any claim to regular church attendance. In Ireland, there Did you say 2%? 2%, yeah, 2% huh. regular church attendance. In Ireland, the collapse of Catholicism is uh, dramatic. But within European society, and particularly within Irish and British society, while there is this collapse, those who identify themselves as members of faith community would not have anything like such a clear division between conservative politics and uh, faith and faith. For instance, in a fairly recent vote for gay marriage in Ireland, mm -hmm. the Irish Association of Evangelicals was one of the supporting bodies in contrast to the Catholic Church, which did not support it. Hmm. Given that situation, and given the fact that Ireland in particular has tended to follow America, I'd be somewhat interested in that. But I'd also wonder how, for instance, the Amish might identify in such a very different and evolving context to that which seems to be that of America at the moment, uh, according to your analysis, if that question makes any kind of sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm nearly afraid as an Irish socialist, I think perhaps I should run for the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I was aware that, you know, involvement, particularly in, in religious institutions, uh, is much lower there. Your, um, your comment, though, about those who are involved and how it doesn't get interwoven with politics the way it does here, um, that's really in interesting to me. Um, the, uh, the, the, the direction in, in the United States in terms of, of all the statistics on church attendance, institutional involvement with formal religion, is really going much more uh, in the direction of, of Europe than, than what it was 30 or 40 years ago. It's, uh, and and I, I, don't, I tend to s stay clear of the term secularization because it kind of, you, you tend to think in terms of a process that's just ongoing and it kind of impacts everyone. Um, and, you know, if we're thinking more tribally here for the moment, that, um, that the, the, there is a secular camp in this country that is, has been growing by leaps and bounds. Um, uh, when, when I started teaching sociology, we talked about how the, main, uh, the, the conservative churches were growing and the mainline churches were declining. And now all churches are declining, the Southern Baptists even, that, that were held up as a, a group that was growing over a period of time, you know, they've been, they've been declining in numbers. And about the only religion that's, that's clearly uh, taking off is this group of people who, who are unaffiliated and don't really participate in institutional religion. Not all of those people are unreligious or would describe themselves as unreligious, but many of them would. Thank you. Mm. Going along with that same theme, um, I, I was wondering if you had a timeline of sort of 
cause and effect type things leading toward the uh, secularization, you know, like, you know, just to see, you know, events along a timeline that help contribute to the uh, lack of church attendance, you know, conservative, Protestant, uh, Catholic, Christian of all types. Um, is that something that you've delved into or, I mean, cause we're looking at, we're looking at the results of it. You know, you're seeing the snapshot in, in 2017 of, of what's happened. Um, but is, do you have any data to go back and say how much it's changed and, and, and put a sort of a chicken and egg uh, to it, you know, a cause and effect? I, I could certainly go back in time and give you a, a, a historical trajectory. There's a lot of good data that enable you to do that. Um, uh, why exactly it takes the turn it does at different points in time uh, is, is hard to tell. Um, some of the attempts to understand what might be causing that presently are focus on the issue of homosexuality. Um, that, that progressives have been leaving the churches in droves be, uh, over that issue. That they just feel that there there isn't room left in them for the churches. In the churches, there aren't that many progressive churches, and when they see, see evangelical churches taking really strong positions on things like that, they kind of write off the church as an institution and leave. There are studies of, of people who have left the church and and asking people in that secular camp, why are you not involved with religion? And that's one of the most common responses that they get. Steve? <laughs> So one, one, more, uh, one more question um, for you. Um, uh, so you've been, you, you sort of were, were hinting at this uh, uh, at the end, um, but so I'll, I'll ask, I guess, one more time. What do you, or not one more time, I'm asking it for the first time, but I'm giving you one more chance to uh, tell us <laughs> what, um, what, what is the world 20 years from now uh, going to look like in America? Do you know that sociologists hate it when you ask questions like that? No, no, no but you, you don't hate it as much as when people ask historians that, so that's why I have to. Well, it, 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 is, it is something that, that I've really gotten interested in working on this and turning back to the Amish, because some of the things that have happened to the Amish had a huge impact upon some other traditions. I mean, um, the old German Baptists are a good example. You know, they, they've moved off the farm to a great extent a, a long time ago and, and got involved more in a variety of occupations, some of which require a good bit of education and, and it's, it's caused problems with technology and how to handle technology that has caused splits uh, in, that, in that denomination within the last dozen years. And uh, you know, the more you're interacting with the English, uh, the Amish are, are a bit unique in trying to preserve this separate language. But the more you're interacting with the English, um, you, you know, how can you continue that? And actually, I was thinking of your book on history in, in uh, response to that question where I think you talked about Amun and the formation of the Amish and some of the division in leaving the, the, the Swiss Anabaptists was over uh, how to think about where they called the brave-hearted or the good-hearted? True-hearted, True yeah. And, uh, and, and I wondered, you know, are, 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 the, are the English or modern Americans who are kind of titillated, I use that word, with the Amish 
and flatter them and are very interested in them and are buying all their goods, are, are, are they kind of, I don't know how true-hearted they are, but are they kind of a, a new version of the true-hearted where there will be a, some, some kind of uh, crisis and how do we deal with these people and how do we draw some limits with people that we're interacting with all the time now in, in, our, in our daily life? So those are the kinds of questions that have occurred to me. And, and I think, I, I, I kind of feel like the story of how the Amish have made the right choices with technology through the 20th century uh, to, to preserve boundaries and preserve their way of life, I just have a sense that in a, in a more fluid situation where the world is, is more complicated, that that might be much harder to do and that, uh, yeah, you know, that uh, they won't know the consequences of, their, of the decisions they make. The advantage the Amish have is, is they're, unlike the old German Baptists, they're not under one big umbrella where they're all trying to hold to the same order or the same discipline. And so yet, each congregation, in a sense, becomes a, a bit of a test case. And you could see something happening over here and, and respond to it uh, because everybody isn't trying to do things in exactly the same way. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. But it doesn't Thanks. give you the answer about what exactly is going to happen. No, but you're, 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 uh, you're more free with uh, your predictions than a historian ever would be. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Carl. <laughs>